Hi, Pastor John here welcoming you to our broadcast. You know, most of us are familiar with what has come to be known as the Triumphal Entry. Now we draw that title from those passages that depict Jesus as he enters Jerusalem just prior to the crucifixion. That day, which has traditionally become known as Palm Sunday, comes a week before the Western world celebrates Easter Sunday and marks the beginning of Holy Week. Our passage today focuses on the entry, but also takes a close look at the crowd and the different types of folks in it. Let's see what Mark chapter 11 verses 1 through 19 reveal as we ask the question, which one are you? Let's just take, let's just take a minute and, um, you know, we, we had a tragic event that happened in Nashville this week. I know it was four or five days ago and that's way bad, but let, let me give you a little bit of background about Covenant Christian School in Nashville. Um, they, they're a ministry of the Presbyterian Church there uh, on Sunday, the pastor got up and, and preached a sermon out of John 12, very clear gospel message. His daughter was one of the victims, nine years old. And, um, you know, I've been asked to be on the trustee committee at Covenant Christian Academy. I got a few phone calls from some of those folks this week saying, this cuts too close to home. The names are similar. We're the same size, same mission. Uh, so these things impact us in ripples that we don't fully understand, but we also need to understand the age that we're in. Um, and so I'd like to just spend a, a quiet moment remembering the victims and their families in Nashville. Father, you know all things, and we know your will is perfect. We also know that there will be trials and tribulations in life here until we stand in glory. So we ask your blessing on those families. We ask your blessing on that school, that church, for being bold with the gospel, Father, and for, for taking it into the community. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit, by his presence and power, would begin the healing process on those broken hearts. Let us ever keep mindful, Father, that we live in an evil time. And that there will be times that you call upon us to stand on our faith. We pray that you would give us the strength that those people have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 11. We're going to be in verses 1 through 19. Here's what Mark has to say about this moment in Jesus' ministry. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied to the door outside in the street, and, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything as it was already laid, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple. 
began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you've made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out to the city. Word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. I was a young guy going for a job interview, and one of the things I was very proud of myself when I did interviews was I was a good interviewer. So it was kind of an important job for me. I wanted it badly. And I thought I was prepped. I'd looked at the company and who the offers of the company were and everything. And I went into this little office and I sat down and the guy sitting across the desk from me looked at me and said, look, before you say anything, let me tell you something. There are two types of people that come into this room looking for a job. Those that can do the job and those that think they can do the job. Which one are you? And all of a sudden, my mind started playing tricks on me. I went, well, I think I can do the job, but uh, I'm pretty... uh, I was having an existential crisis. (laughs) I didn't know how to answer the guy. I'm sitting there, my face is turning red. I'm starting to sweat. But the, the question, the question is, which one are you? It defines who we are, doesn't it? No matter, no matter what we're talking about, it defines some aspect about who we are. That's our question today. That's also the title of our sermon, Which One Are You? Now, in Mark, immediately before this passage, Jesus delivers his last message to his followers. He tells them, he tells them he's going to Jerusalem to die. He's going to be tortured and die. They don't listen. They're so oblivious to what he's saying. The two of them say, hey, Jesus, can we sit on your right hand? Jesus says, well, you know, I don't know if you understand the cup I'm about to drink. And you will drink from that cup. But this is not going to be what you think it is. And then right after that, he delivers a blind man. Now, none of this happens by by coincidence. There's purpose to all of this. Jesus knows that nobody really understands what's going on. And on his way to Jerusalem, he stops and delivers this blind man as if to say, you know, right now you don't see real well. But there'll come a day, and I'm going to initiate that day where you'll see very clearly. So in all the other gospels, he he calls Lazarus out of a tomb, raises a guy that's been dead for four days. And all of these scenarios, if If you put them together, they paint a picture of what is about to transpire in Jerusalem as they prepare to observe the Passover. It's the biggest festival of the year. So in our passage, we're going to see four aspects of Jesus' coming to Jerusalem. Uh, And each one of these aspects is going to reveal a particular type of person. So in verses 1 through 7, we'll see the provisions of his coming. In verses 8 through 11, we'll see the popularity of his coming. I work hard on these peace guys, okay? 12 through 14, the poignancy of his coming. I had to struggle for that one. And 15 through 19, the purpose of his coming. So let's take a look at the provisions of Jesus' coming, starting with verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, actually the pronunciation is Bethphage, uh, but we're going to go with the English pronunciation here, Bethphage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. And they said to him, He said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. Now, these are some pretty explicit instructions. This is pretty graphic. And the first thing we kind of wonder is, how does Jesus know all this? You know, and we we can discuss that a little bit, but I've got to tell you something. Trying to figure out how he knows all this misses the point. And here's one of the points that's being made in this passage. Only animals that were unused, 
only animals that had never carried a burden were suitable to be dedicated to God for his use as he saw fit. Jesus is sending a subtle message here. He says, I'm, I'm worthy of riding on an animal that's never been used. You understand what's happening here? You can see him looking at the disciples, just seeing if they get it. In verse 3, he says, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And we'll, and we'll send it back here immediately. It sounds fairly simple. But th- this is another subtle hint of who Jesus is. Only a king or an emperor or a representative of the king or emperor has the authority to commandeer an animal. You couldn't just go use any, anyone else's animal. We're seeing a theme here. Jesus trying to say something very subtle, very kind of underneath the surface. Jesus even knows what to do in the case of contingencies, doesn't he? Tell them the Lord has use for it. He uses the word kurios here, the Greek word kurios. It means Lord, we all know that. But the connotation to the first century Jews was it, it, it meant master. It meant owner. It meant benevolent owner. Jesus was saying, if they ask you, tell them it's okay. Tell them I own the donkey. It's mine. Scripture tells us God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, this isn't trying to describe God as some kind of farmer. It's a metaphor that says God owns everything. A thousand hills, who can count those? Did Jesus make preparations ahead of time? Is Jesus uttering some kind of prophecy? Did he go ahead and uh, before everybody got there and go into the village and say, hey, do this and do that? But keep in mind, he's God. And it's not for us to know how he knows. And I think he does this so that we know that he knows. Look what happens, verse 4. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus said, and they let him go. Now, we're not told why these people let the disciples take the colt. We don't know if the people in town are believers. We know they're Jewish. All we know is that they let the colt be taken. We do know that this is not a case of, I don't want to get involved. I don't know what's going on here. Because that's not how the culture worked. You didn't let somebody steal somebody else's Belongings, because that would bring dishonor to the village, dishonor to the name, dishonor to their father in heaven. They had an obligation and a duty to protect each other. And they knew that stealing something was a violation of God's law. And we don't know why they let them take the donkey, because the point of this little scenario is, is that everything happens precisely as Jesus says it will happen. Then verse 7, he says, And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And as Jesus sits on the colt, prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9 is fulfilled. The stage is set. All the preparations for his entry into Jerusalem have been made. Now it's time for Jesus to follow that winding path down the Mount of Olives and into Jerusalem, about three-quarters of a mile. And in all these plans, in all these provisions, what we see is our first type of person. The first type of person is a faithful follower of Christ. The disciples don't understand everything that's going on, but they're doing exactly what Jesus is telling them to do. Let's take a look at the popularity of his coming. Verse 8. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And all, this, all of this activity here is indicative of the way a major city would greet a conquering king. In particular, uh, one that they would honor for delivering them from the enemy. And this is one of the prime pieces of evidence right here that these people had heard the stories. They knew about Lazarus. They knew about the teaching. They knew about the miracles. And they were... 
They were expecting Jesus to march into town and vanquish the Romans. Get them on out of here. Set us up where we belong. They express their expectations even further in verse 9. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And the way we've been taught to picture this is everybody's going, oh, it's the Messiah. Look, everybody, celebrate and worship. Except, except all of these phrases, everything that they're saying here are nationalistic slogans of pride. You know, every time somebody runs for an office, they have a slogan. And yeah, there, there's an element of worship here, but this isn't, oh, God has come in the flesh to redeem us from all of our sins. This is, here comes the victor that's going to finally vindicate us. They're not really cries of worship. Yes, they believe that, peop- that Jesus may be the Messiah, but they expect Jesus, the Messiah, to deliver them the way that David did, to defeat the enemies and the oppressors of Israel who at that particular point happened to be Rome. I wonder, if, in the middle of all that activity, if they were a little bit perplexed at what happened there, because this, this is the moment. You know, there's been all this conflict. Everybody knows that there's friction between them and the Pharisees, and there's been some confrontations, but this is the moment. He's coming into Jerusalem. And, you know, I'm stepping outside of Scripture here, but you got to believe that there was an attitude of, finally, everything's going to come together. They're going to see that he's a good guy. This is going to be amazing. So all that's going on, and, and this happens in verse 11. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He looks around and he, he leaves. Where's he going? After the adoration, after all the praise of this multitude of people, maybe a million, maybe a million and a half, they're all there in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Jesus gets off his donkey, looks around and says, okay, guys, let's go home. Totally anticlimactic, isn't it? And all of this is punctuated by this huge throng of people that were ecstatic to see him because because of what they thought he had come to do. And here we find our second type of individual in this passage. Those who have expectations of Jesus. Let's take a look at the poignancy of his coming. Verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, verse 14, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. What a curious interlude. All this activity, praise, songs, palm leaves, coats on the ground. And this moment here reveals the the somber nature around Jesus as he came into Jerusalem. None of of those moments came a little bit earlier. He was on his way down the Mount of Olives. He got about halfway down, and he stopped, and he wept over Jerusalem. Everybody's waiting. You can hear the noise coming from the city. Everybody's waiting, and he stops, and he weeps. And, And now thousands are waiting to cheer him on, and And he cries, and he knew Jerusalem was about to miss what he called their visitation, to miss the Messiah. And now he stops on his way to the temple to curse this tree for not bearing fruit. And worse yet, it's out of season. There's no expectation of fruit on the tree. And he doesn't explain himself to the disciples again. He only pronounces a curse on the tree people around Jesus are left to wonder about what's going on and this, this, is, this is a sobering moment and poignant all the praise and all the singing Jesus stops to talk about this tree you can just feel the people standing around him saying 
Well, wait a minute. This is his moment. We were here last night. We went back. Now we're back again. This is the big day. Why is he worried about this tree? And in this, we find our third type of person. The one who wonders about Jesus, questions him. What's he doing? Why is he doing it? And then right after the fig tree, we learn this, the purpose of his coming, verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Now, those of you who have been with us for a while have heard me talk about this before. This is not about selling cookies in the foyer. Every time we put up a table for some fundraiser or something, somebody goes, oh, there are money changers in the church. This is not what's going on here. So we need to be careful. Let me give you some background. Over the years since Herod built this temple, vendors had been allowed to come into the outer courts. Now, previous to that, the vendors had to stay out of the outer courts. They were off the temple mount, around the walls of the, the temple. The outer courts were designed for evangelism. They were designed for, to, for the Jews to bring Gentiles to come in and hear the word of God, to hear the teaching of the teachers that would run around in the, in the outer courts, relating scriptural truths, teaching about God. But by Jesus' time, by the first century, the outer courts had become a flea market, and it was crowded. All these tables and and booths and temps. And this is a place where the vendors who paid a healthy sum to the chief priests to be allowed to be there would charge outrageous amounts of money for a sacrificial animal. Or charge usurious sums to exchange currency, nationalistic currency for temple currency. And making matters worse the chief priests had declared that only sacrifices purchased in the outer courts were eligible for the sacrifice. Currency, the only currency taken in the outer courts and in the temple would be temple currency, and temple currency wasn't available outside in the city. So this is what it looked like when pilgrims would arrive in Jerusalem and come to the temple. You had to make a sacrifice for the sins of your family. That was also when you paid the temple tax, and you were also expected to make a donation to the temple. But your money, whatever you came with, was no good. So as soon as you came to the temple mount, there were money changers who would exchange your currency for temple coins, only at an outrageous amount exchange rate. And temple coins were only available in the outer courts. Then you would take your money and pay your temple tax and make a donation. Then you would purchase a sacrifice from one of the vendors in the outer courts. Then you would take that sacrifice to the priest and hope and hope that he would actually sacrifice it because there were times that they would just sell them back to the vendors in the outer courts. And they would literally say, Oh, we got plenty of sacrifices. We don't need this one. Sell it back to this guy so he can sell it again. With all this going on, there were vendors and travelers that wanted to cut through the the temple mount rather than go all the way around it. They wanted to take a shortcut through the temple rather than walk all the way around. And they would have to pay somebody at the gate in order to gain access and frequently when they got to the other side they would have to pay somebody to get off kind of a toll the temple and the temple grounds had become this giant money making machine you know what the only thing they were missing was a Chick-fil-A <laughs> buy your food here Mine start over here There was no longer room for the people to come and hear the teachings of God. No longer room to bring people in to evangelize them. And Jesus drives them all away. 
And his motivations are made clear. Verse 17, he said, he was teaching them and saying to them, it is, not, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Key phrase. Well, you made it a den of robbers. Temples for everyone, not just an elite few. The priesthood and everything around the temple had become a celebration of self-serving greed and pride and exclusivity and a way to make material gain. It was all immersed in worldliness. And the priest's reactions to all this affirm what, what we're saying here. Instead of conviction, we see this, verse 18. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. And they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So Jesus leaves and begins making preparations for the Passover. And the work he came to do, is, it's just beginning. And it, it's not the Romans. It's not with the Romans. He, it's with, it's with God's chosen people. Well, this is a little bit of a surprise. And we find out that Jesus' purpose is to clean up his bride, to make her presentable. And the tragedy is we find out that there are people that are supposedly in the bride that aren't really interested in being cleaned up. So we see our fourth type of person, those who reject Christ. So there's, there's the four aspects of his coming, the provision. Jesus seems to meticulously plan his entrance. All the preparations seem to be arranged logistically, logically. But then we see these subtle hints, hints that, that he really is the king, the owner of everything. He has dominion over everything. He hints that he's the king. He's the master of all creation. And taking all those hints into consideration, we begin to kind of get the feeling that Jesus isn't making preparations for his entry into Jerusalem. He's preparing his followers. Literally saying to them, you know, I'm the king. Look what they do to your king. Watch what they're about to do to your king because, because they're going to do the same thing to you. If you're willing to look underneath the surface, you see this. We saw the popularity of his coming. The crowd loves him. They're waving palm leaves, singing songs, laying their coats in front of them, all signs of honor, but that honor... That honor comes with a certain expectation. They all think he's there to vindicate them, to reward them, to do what they think he came to do. And we saw the poignancy of his coming. The crowd and maybe the disciples as well see Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem as a moment of triumph. We call it the triumphal entry. But he stops to curse a fig tree. What was that about? Well, you know, to understand that, we need to read on a little bit further. We have to read the verses immediately after this passage. And we find out that the paragraph about the temple lies in between the curse of the tree and the disciples going past the tree and seeing it withered and dead. In the example of the fig tree, Jesus is talking about the temple. He's talking about the temple. That's why the temple's in the middle. The fig tree story brackets the temple story. By Jesus' time, the temple's no longer bearing fruit. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's become useless. And within about 40 years, it's going to be gone altogether. Because everything that the temple stood for was realized in Christ. And there's going to be no need for the temple after he arrives. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the purpose of his coming. 
which it's clear that he came to clean up his bride, not to give the Jews some kind of political military victory. What may not be so clear is that he came not just to clean up the temple, but to replace it. You know, we saw the glory of God descend on the tabernacle, right? Then when Solomon built the temple, we saw the glory of God descend on Solomon's temple, right? We don't see that in Herod's temple. We see that because that moment was reserved for the moment that Jesus Christ walked into the temple. Just nobody realized what it was. No one recognized it for what it was. Jesus talked about the temple being torn down and rebuilt in three days, and people just got upset with him. Oh, look at this beautiful temple. How could it be blah, 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 blah. He's talking about those three days that he spends in the tomb. When he emerged, the temple was no longer needed. You know, it would be easy to say he was the new temple, but he wasn't the new temple, folks. Everything the temple symbolized pointed towards him. The temple was an inadequate, imperfect representation of Christ. And in him, the perfect sacrifice, there's an end to all sacrifices. In him, the object of our worship, there's no need to travel to worship him. In him, the perfect high priest, we all become members of a royal priesthood. So in our, in our passage, we saw these four types of people, and I got to ask you, what type are you? I had this moment of indecision when I'm sitting in front of that guy. You know, it was long before I got saved. I'd like to think if I had that opportunity again, I would say, I don't know what you're looking for, but I'm a follower of Christ. So there are only these four types here. They're faithful followers. Are you willing to do what Jesus tells you to do even if you don't understand it? We have those who have expectations of Christ. Are you only in it so long as he does what you think he should do? If you get disappointed in him, is it time to fall away? We have those who wonder about Christ. You know, when Paul goes to Athens, he sits and he talks to the people on Mars Hill, and he gets all these different types of responses, and some of them are, gee, that's interesting. Why don't you come back and debate it some other time? We love dialogue. Or are you one who rejects Christ? Because I'm going to tell you something. Only one of those groups gets to be with him forever. This is the prelude to Jesus doing all the work that any of us ever needs in order to be saved. It's his sacrifice on the cross. Which one are you? So as we, as we prepare ourselves for communion, and I've checked, we've got the stuff. If you were here last week, you know, I was a little confused pretty much state of being for me. But as we prepare our hearts for communion, we have several visitors here today. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've confessed him as Lord and Savior, if you repented from your sins, uh, you're welcome to take communion with us. If, if you haven't made that move, if you haven't made that commitment, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. But I'm going to ask you respectfully to just pass on the elements. So I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward. We're going to pass out the the bread, and we'll take it together. There is a gluten-free alternative. And while they're passing that out, I want you to think about this. Go ahead. Thank you, guys. I want you to think about this. This, this is the beginning of Holy Week. This is the beginning of that, that last week that Jesus spends in his ministry. Uh, every day is significant. And it leads up to the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so we, we do this today as a remembrance of what he did for us. Um, but there's so much more than that. Because we, we're actually participating right now 
those of you who call upon his name as Lord, we're participating right now in what he did. We're part of it. We're one with him. We're one with each other. So we don't take this frivolously. We don't take it as a reminder of something that's been done. It certainly is that, but it's not just a reminder. It's our opportunity to walk in the fullness of the gospel, even as we sit here. So I want you to go back to that smoky room. You know, it was not only smoky, it was hot. And the disciples are gathered around. They're there for Passover dinner. They're there for the symbolism of each element of, of the, the Seder, the feast. Jesus has something completely different in mind. And when he holds up the bread, he says, this is my body. And you could see them going, what did he say? It, it's the bread, right? It's been the bread for 2,000 years. Jesus is saying from this moment on, everything changes. As far as being the people of God, you've done a pretty decent job, but I'm here to tell you everything changes right now. So he declares it to be his body. And he says, take and eat. I don't know what's going through their minds as they ate that bread. But I'll tell you what goes through mine. What kind of miracle is this? What, what has happened to me supernaturally? Jesus said, this is his body. I have no choice but to believe that. It's his body. And I'm eating it because his promise has become one with me and for me to be one with him, and for him to be one with the Father. What a beautiful symbol of the sacrifice he made for us. while they're still pondering that he takes the cup and he says this is my blood now he he had said as much to a large number of people a couple days prior and most of those people left because that was just a little too weird for them but he does it again in front of the disciples a smaller group He says, this is my blood. Now, I I want to take you back to Cana. Uh, The very first miracle that Jesus performs is at the wedding of Cana. And we're all familiar with it. He turns the water into wine. But what you might not be familiar with is the water that he turns into wine is the sacramental water. It's the water that they use to cleanse the utensils they're about to use in the ceremony. So when, when Mary comes and goes, hey, do something, he says, woman, my hour has not yet come. He's telling her, you know, when I do this, it's going to set in motion that arrow to your heart that you've been promised for being my mother. Mary gets it. Turns to the servant and says, do what he says. And the servants, he tells the servants, go take that water and take it to the master. The, the servant, servants have to fill their vessels with water and walk over to the master and go, here's the wine. But what Jesus is saying, you know, we find out in the upper room that wine and blood are symbols for each other, right? What Jesus is saying, what has been washed in water will now be washed in blood. And you'll see the fullness of this just before they crucify me. So when he holds out that cup and says, this is my blood, the disciples have already heard that the blood 
will cleanse you. And we'll talk more about that next week. But it's an utterly profound moment because it's part of everything changes. The broken body restores us to God. The blood cleanses us so that we can be in his presence. And he said, take and drink. In another day, his last words were, it is finished. And that's the good news for us, brothers and sisters. The work of Christ is finished. We don't have anything to add to it. We can't take anything away from it. It's finished. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this so-called triumphal entry. Lord, we give you thanks for everything that is right there on the surface, which is good and true. We also give you thanks for everything that is beneath the surface, Lord. Your word is so wonderful that the more we dig into it, the more we see, the more we learn about you. We pray you would quicken to our hearts, Father, the truth of the sacrifice that was made for us, the truth of what that dinner meant, and the fulfillment of it. As Jesus walks out of that tomb, prepare our hearts to celebrate that day, Father. Make us a ready people to be people that have been changed by the body and the blood, changed by the cross, and forever saved by the exit from the tomb. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Next Sunday, 10 o'clock, we've got donuts, sugar, caffeine. Bring the kids. (laughs) Thank you for tuning in online. We'll be back next Sunday. Have a good morning. Pastor John back here again. If you are blessed by the service, let me ask you to do us a favor. Would you click on the like button below that little thumbs up? If you're listening on sermon audio, perhaps you can comment or even share the sermon with someone else. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter at WBFVA. We're on the World Wide Web at WBFVA.org. Let us know if you'd like us to pray for you. If you'd like to support us financially, you can make donations through our website at wbfva.org. Just click on giving. You'll receive a tax deductible receipt at the end of the year. Either way, we would love to hear from you or even have you visit us in person one Sunday. We meet at 46 Winchester Street in downtown Warrington, Virginia at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. And now, may God bless you richly until we gather again.